Chapter Twenty Three of Kitty Alone by Sabine Baring Gould. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Marianne. Chapter Twenty Three, Borrowing. It is you, you too," exclaimed Pepperell as he reached the summit. He gasped the words. He could not shout. So short of breath was he. His face, with heat, was purple as a blackberry. What's the meaning of this? He held to a projection of granite and panted. Interfering with the law, protecting a scoundrel. He paused to wipe his face. A malefactor, a criminal, guilty. Again, gasping like a fish out of water. Guilty of incendiarism, of arson, of felony. Why, Pasco? You're hot. Keep cool, old boy," said Jason, laughing. "Who has created you constable or sheriff of the county, that you are so anxious to apprehend rogues? Rogues, rogues. Only rogues assist rogues in escaping the reward of their deeds. Is there a warrant out for his apprehension? I don't know." Then what on earth makes you put yourself in a heat and commotion to catch him? Pasco mopped his brow and, tearing up some ferns, dry though they were, proceeded to fan his face. Why do you ask? For the public security, of course. And now, again he puffed. Now I can't talk. My wind is gone. Pepero looked into the ravine. He could see that the men on the farther side of the stream were at a nonplus. The fugitive had escaped them, had dived out of their sight into the coppice wood, and they knew that pursuit was in vain. He turned sharply on his brother-in-law. "This is your doing, you and Kate. First you give him work, then you let him escape. He who helps a felon is a felon himself." "My dear Pasco," said Jason Quorum, laughing. What makes you so fiery in this matter? Fiery, of course I'm fiery, and look there, Jason, there are the workmen, a dozen of them, doing nothing, and we shall have to pay their wages for half a day, and nothing to show for it. Whose fault is that? You sent them from their tasks. Yes, to catch a villain, which was no concern of yours. It is a concern of mine and of every honest man. How can one be safe with such a malefactor at large? I have my house, my stores. I shall not be able to sleep at night with ease, knowing that this fellow is at large. If anything happens, I shall come on you. You'll get nothing from me. That's the worst of it. I know it. Why did you help the man to escape? No one is safe. No one, and I, least of all, for now he regards me as his enemy. He has sworn vengeance. He may come on me and cut my throat. Not much throat to be cut, Pasco. There is my money box. Box, not money. He may set fire to my house, my barns, burn me and my wife, your sister, Kitty, your daughter. Don't you care for that? I am not afraid. If you went after him and have angered him, well, we helped him, as you suppose, and have won his good will. As I know, have I not found you here? Who else could have rolled down the rocks? Show me your hands. There, I said so. There is blood on Kate's hands. They are cut and bruised. She has been doing what she could, and you, her father. Who ought to have known better, have encouraged her. Rascals, rogues, rogues all. And oh, how honest am I, eh, Pasco? Of course, I'm an honest man. I don't encourage burglars and murderers and incendiaries. I did not know that Redmore was a murderer or a burglar. Who can say? But. Having been an incendiary, he may go on to murder and plunder. These things run together. 
one who can commit arson is capable of doing the other crimes as well. I shall have to drive back to Ashburton alone. Kitty returns with you. What help is there in Kitty? That fellow Roger, full of rage and desire of revenge, is about the woods, and may shoot me. He has not a gun. He may spring upon me with his axe. He has thrown it away, said Kate. You mind your own concerns, exclaimed the angry man, turning on his niece. There are plenty of ways in which he may fall on me and murder me, and then he will pick my pockets and make off in my clothes, and Kitty will help him. You are talking nonsense, Pasco. Are you such a weakling that you cannot defend yourself? But, psh, the man will not injure you. He will steal by night to Coombe. His wife is there. His children are there. He knows where I am. He has sworn revenge against me. When? When he escaped? No. Before I set the men after him. Before he knew you would hunt him? A probable story. Probable or improbable, it is true. I threatened him, and I would have arrested him, but could not. Kate knows I had him by the throat, but he was armed with his axe, and I could not retain him. Then he swore he would do me an evil turn, and he will keep his word. He cannot harm you. He is afraid for himself. He can harm me. He can do to my house, my stores, what he did to Pook's Rick. Well, that would not hurt you greatly. You are insured over value. Not over value, with the wool in. You were a fool about that wool, Pasco. Why did you not consult me before dealing with Coker? I knew of the fall. Oh, you know everything. You knew that the Brimps oak bark was worth three times more than it is, and now you are felling without considering that the bark at present is practically worthless. The sap doesn't run. If the sap ran like the dart, it would not make the bark sell for tan. You either knew nothing about the conditions, or you willfully deceived me, and I dare be sworn it was the latter. I can believe even that of you now, a favorer of incendiaries. Come, do not be extravagant. What other criminals have I ever favored? I am too hot and too angry to argue, retorted Pasco. But I want to know something for certain about this brimp's wood. It is well enough to cut it down, but what I want to know is, how will you transport the oak so as to make it pay? Sell on the spot. To whom? To timber merchants. They will reckon the cost of carriage. We shan't have to pay for it. We shall sell at a good price. We shall sell. Such oak as Brimp's oak is not to be had every day. Have you offered it to anyone? Advertised it? No, I have not. Time for that when it is all felled. You will make as much a misreckoning in this as you have along of the bar. Trust me, the oak will sell high. You said the same of the bark. All your ducks are swans. I must have money. So must I, said Quorm. I want it as the March fields want April showers. I am in immediate need, urged Pepperwell. In a fortnight I shall require money to pay the men their wages, observed Quorm. I have nothing. You were right. I have a cash box, but no cash in it. I have paid away all I had. Dispose of something, said Quorm cheerily. Dispose of what? Coals? No one wants coals now. Then something else. Wool? And lose on every pound? That were fatal. I have not paid for all the wool yet. I want money to satisfy the coal merchant, money to meet the bill I gave Coker, and then the agent for the bank who has its hold on the Brimps estate says we may not remove a stick till everything is paid. Then do not remove, said Quorum. Sell on the spot. To whom? There are plenty will buy. Why have you not advertised? asked Pasco testily. 
For one thing, because I did not know you were in immediate need of cash. For the other, because, till the timber is down, it cannot be measured. Never sell sticks standing. A timber merchant will always buy the trees before felled, and many a landowner is fool enough to sell standing trees. The merchant knows his gain, the landlord does not know his loss. Felled or unfelled, I must realize. My condition is desperate. I cannot meet any of the demands on me. Pepperwell had lost his purple color. He wiped his brow again, but this time the drops did not rise from heat, but from uneasiness of mind. You have drawn me into this brimps venture, and I have now all my fortunes on one bottom. If this fails, I am ruined. There will remain nothing for me but to sell cum sellers. And then, I am cast forth as a beggar into the roads. I have trusted you. You must not fail me. Oh, all will come right in the end. The end, the end, it must come right now. I tell you that I have to meet the demands of the bank, or I can do nothing with the sale of the oak, and all now hangs on that. Owing to the ruinous purchase of Coker's fleeces, I am driven to desperate straits. I cannot sell them at a loss. I calculated it with the schoolmaster, a loss of some hundred and twenty pounds. You must help me out of my difficulty. I can suggest but one thing. Go to Devonport and see if the government dockyard will buy the oak. Shipbuilding can't go on without material. If government will take the timber, you need not concern yourself about the bank's demand. It will be satisfied, and more than satisfied. That money is safe. Bless you. In these times a man is happy to see his money within twelve months of him, and know he must have it. I don't mind, but I'll go to Davenport at once, said Pepperell. Whilst the conversation thus detailed was taking place, the three had crossed a strip of moor that intervened between Sharpator and the high road, walking slowly, for Pasco was fagged with his scramble, and Jason was crippled. I don't mind, said Pasco again, but I shall want a few pounds to take me there, and my pockets are empty. I can't help you. Mine wouldn't yield if wrung out. Here comes the parson, said Pepperell. Our parson, jogging along as if nothing were the matter and went contrary in the world. I'll borrow of him. Oh, uncle, protested Kate, flushing crimson. Pray do not, if you have no chance of paying. You impudent hussy! Mind your own concerns, answered Pasco angrily. I, with no chance of paying. I'm a man of means. I'll let you see what that signifies. How do you do, parson? What? My church warden? exclaimed Mr. Fielding, drawing rein. What brings you to the moors? Business, sir, a trifle with regard to oak timber. I've bought the brimps wood, cost me a few hundred, and will bring me a thousand. Glad to hear it, Mr. Pepperell, and then we shall have a double subscription to our school. I dare say, Mr. Fielding, I am a free man with my money, as you and others have found. And, by the way, talking of that, could you kindly accommodate me with a little loan of a few pounds? I started from home without a thought but of returning to-day, and I learn that the government has an eye on these oaks, first-rate timber, and I must to Devonport to strike a bargain. I won't come to their terms. They must come to mine. Such timber as this is worth its weight in gold. How much do you want, Mr. Pepperill? How much can you spare, Mr. Fielding? Well, let me see. The rector of Coombe opened his purse. I have about six guineas here. I shall want to retain one for current expenses. When can you let me have the loan returned? Any day. I'll drop you a line to my wife, or on my return. I'm only going to Devonport to get the best price for the timber, and then I shall be back. And if you can spare me five guineas, or five sovereigns, I shall be obliged. You know me, a man of substance, a man of means, a warm man. We represent the church, do we not, Mr. Fielding? And hang dissenters all, say I. 
"'I can let you have five pounds,' said the rector. "'I see I am short of silver.' "'That will suffice,' answered Pasco, with dignity. "'I will let you have it back directly I have settled with government about the oaks.' Mr. Fielding gave Pepperell the gold, then excused himself as he desired to reach home before dark, and rode on his way. "'I had no idea that to borrow was so easy,' said Pasco. "'Of course, all depends on the man who asks. Everyone knows me, sound as the Bank of England.' "'And same thing,' said Quorm, "'all depends on the man solicited.' Then Pepperell, with his hands in his pockets and head in the air, his spirits revived as though he had borrowed five hundred pounds in place of five pounds, walked toward Dartmeet Bridge, humming the old harvest song. We've cheated the parson, we'll cheat him again, for why should the vicar have one in ten, one in ten? We'll drink off our liquor, while we can stand and hey for the honor of old england old england end of chapter 23